Dublin is the capital of the Irish Republic, a city of musicians, poets and dreamers, and also a financial centre. Its many old buildings indicate its long and dramatic past. Those who visit the city enter a world of fantasy and adventure. Dublin's Georgian buildings, whiskey distilleries and historic castles are tangible and colourful reminders of bygone times. Numerous well-preserved buildings, cafes, churches and idyllic canals also add to the captivating atmosphere of this fun-loving city. Dublin was founded by the Vikings within a wonderful valley where the river Liffey flows into the Atlantic Ocean. One of the city's main landmarks is this splendid structure, Hapenny Bridge. It derived its name due to a toll that was once extracted from those who crossed it. Various Celtic tribes settled here prior to the arrival of the Vikings. The actual city developed in the middle of the 9th century. It was at that time that Danish invaders built the first fortified settlement close to today's Dublin Castle. Dublin, or Black Pond as the Danes called it, soon became an important trading centre. Over the centuries, a number of bridges were built here each in the architecture of the day, and the riverbanks were gradually strengthened. However, the river divided the city into both north and south, and rich and poor. With flourishing trade came taxes and tolls. Large administrative office buildings were constructed on the banks of the river. The last custom house to be built was completed in 1791. Far from looking like a typical custom house, James Gandon designed a building with a grand facade. The focus of much hostility from local traders, the building took 10 years to construct. Indeed, Gandon carried a gun in order to protect himself. Dublin Castle is one of the city's oldest buildings. It's seen much transformation and is a combination of several building styles. After the Vikings, the Normans conquered the city and ruled over it for 700 years. And under King Henry VIII, Dublin became the capital of what was then a British colony. King Henry broke off his ties with the Roman Catholic Church. As King of Ireland, he became the spiritual head of the newly founded and Protestant Church of Ireland. Only the record tower and sturdy external walls have survived of the Anglo-Norman castle. The main part of today's castle, as well as the splendid state apartments, were built in the 18th century.
Today, these fine rooms are used for various of the Irish Republic's official events. The furnishings date back to when the British occupied the city and, as some Irishmen view it, exploited the country. Various items such as vases and clocks are well protected because in 1907 the crown jewels were stolen and have not yet been recovered. For Ireland's presidency of the European Union in the first half of 1990, Dublin Castle was extensively renovated. The centre of power of this old city is still highly impressive. Trinity College is Ireland's oldest and most venerable university. It was founded in 1592 by Queen Elizabeth I. The high standard of education offered here has attracted famous pupils such as Jonathan Swift, Henry Grattan and Samuel Beckett. The library contains one of the most valuable treasures of Irish culture, the Book of Kells, illustrated texts that dates back to the 8th century. A large area of paved squares, the relaxing inner courtyards, possess shady trees and pleasant lawns. Merrion Square consists of a number of fine old buildings, impressive reminders of the golden 18th century. At that time, after London, Dublin was the second most important city to the British Empire. The city's Anglo-Irish Protestants engaged numerous British designers to create these architectural masterpieces. The famous Dublin doors, the colourful doors of the city's Georgian buildings, decorate the intriguing facades. The centre of the square features a park and a bust of Michael Collins, an IRA leader who fought against the British. In Easter 1916, the Irish Republic was born. The General Post Office, a national sanctuary. Of classic design, this building was once the site of an important historical event. Under the leadership of Podrag Pierce and James Connolly, around a hundred men occupied the post office. Thus began Ireland's struggle for independence. In 1925, the main post office was fully restored. The thrilling history of this place that once played such a key role in Ireland's history is a truly memorable experience. Numerous statues commemorate those who occupied the post office. Up until the 17th century, St. Stephen's Green was just an empty space. It was subsequently surrounded by Georgian houses and became the largest square in Europe. 
In the centre of the park are small gardens, ponds, fountains and pavilions. A green oasis in the middle of the city. Sir Arthur Guinness, grandchild of the founder of the famous brewery, created this park in 1880 and donated it to the city. During the day, the green is a popular place, and in the evening, its pubs are kept busy. At each of the entrances to the huge park, horse-drawn carriages await their passengers, like a scene of times gone by. There is one thing that all Irishmen have in common, their insatiable thirst for Guinness. Thus it's essential to visit the famous Guinness Brewery. An exhibition explains how the black juice is produced and how it's found its way into 150 countries. Despite modern technology, the recipe is still the same. Irish barley, spring water, hops and malt, plus a special kind of yeast that is a well-kept secret. In 1759, Arthur Guinness bought a small brewery and began to experiment. The result is history. In 2001, no less than 570,000 visitors made this brewery the most popular tourist attraction in Ireland. Next, it's time to sample Ireland's national drink in the Sky Bar. Thanks to Arthur Guinness, this unique brew permeates Dublin's streets and all over the world people continue to enjoy this amazing creation. St. Patrick Cathedral is the largest church in Ireland. At 93 metres long, it's the longest medieval church. Legend has it that St. Patrick baptised the first Christians here. During the reign of Elizabeth I, St. Patrick became a Protestant church. And during Oliver Cromwell's Irish campaign, it was used as a stable, thus causing a certain amount of destruction. Both fire and various weaknesses in its construction created even more damage, and so Mayor Benjamin Guinness ordered its complete restoration. The cathedral contains the graves of numerous monks, heraldic figures and the banners of Ireland's military regiments. For 32 years, Jonathan Swift was dean here. St. Patrick's is also an Anglican church. Ironically, this mainly Catholic city does not possess a Roman Catholic cathedral. The Dublinia tells the history of the city, from the invasion of the Anglo-Normans up until the closure of the monasteries. A dramatic period. Reconstructed streets and houses depict the daily life of old, harsh punishment, the horrors of the plague and a busy market. In addition to the life of the city, those who come here can also learn of rebellion, and archaeological finds demonstrate the long history of this ancient settlement.
Located next to the Christ Church are the stylish and noble rooms of Synod Hall. Today, Christ Church Cathedral is also part of the Church of Ireland. It was founded in 1038 by Dunan, the first Bishop of Dublin. On a piece of land that was given to him by the Viking chief Sitrigur, he had a timber church constructed for his parish. In the 12th century, the Norman conqueror Richard de Clare, also known as Strongbow, together with Lawrence O'Toole, had a large cathedral built here. Transept and the crypt that is supported by various large old pillars dates back to 1180 and represents the oldest area of the church. The church contains many magnificent statues and reliefs. It was here that the most important functionaries made their oath of allegiance and where the English king, Edward VI, was crowned. Ancient stone tomb plates record that not only the Norman knight Strongbow is buried here, but also several important personages of the Middle Ages. In the north of the city is Dublin's Green Lung, Phoenix Park. Covering more than 800 hectares, it's one of the largest parks in the world with forests, lakes, hills, creeks and flower gardens. There are also tea rooms and pavilions. This vast park has been open to the public since the middle of the 18th century. It also features the People's Garden with its colourful flower beds and relaxing benches. In the heart of Phoenix Park is Dublin Zoo that extends for 12 hectares and includes a number of lakes. It's one of the oldest zoos in the world, with both rare and threatened species cared for in a highly controlled environment. In addition to various species of big cat, the flamingo is one of the zoo's most popular attractions. And penguins are also equally at home here. Hippopotamuses and rhinos are also featured. These species have inhabited the zoo since it was inaugurated in 1830. The zoo has been the subject of much transformation, such as a large area known as Out of Africa, with a superb collection of lions, tigers and giraffes. There's even an authentic jungle All the animals here are totally content, thus offspring are a common occurrence. Today, Kilmainham Jail is a national monument dedicated to Ireland's dramatic past.
In this so-called Freedom Fighters prison, many of those who took part in the Easter Rebellion suffered punishment and death. In 1924, it finally closed its doors as a prison. Dark corridors lead to a large hall in which several one-man cells are situated on three levels. Kilmainham Jail was once a political prison. To maintain the strictest security, the prisoners were kept apart. However, in the middle of the 19th century, at the time of the Big Famine, each of these tiny cells held up to six prisoners. Most of the prisoners were common thieves. In those days, it was a crime to steal a loaf of bread. The Kilmainham district marks the beginning of the Grand Canal that travels around the south of Dublin in a semicircle. A fine example of the engineering skills of the 18th century. The canal connects Dublin with the Shannon River and the west of Ireland. It was once an important trading route. Today the Grand Canal is an idyllic place to while away the hours. It's also a popular residential area. Although the canal was closed in 1960, part of it is still used by pleasure craft and many of the locks are still in full working order. In the 19th century, both the Grand Canal and the Royal Canal marked the borders of the city. Today, they surround the city centre. The former warehouse of Jameson's Distillery now features a whiskey factory. Here visitors can learn about the production of this remarkable spirit. Christian monks introduced it to Ireland in the 6th century. Irish whiskey contains barley, water and yeast. It is distilled three times and then stored for 10 years in mature sherry barrels. Its distinctive taste comes from a very special blend of barley, water and various distilling processes. The final result is managed by a busy accounts department visitors are invited into an old Victorian bar in which they can try it for themselves. Located on the south bank of the River Liffey, the city's current fashionable district with its narrow paved streets derived its name from William Temple who bought this plot of land in around 1600. In the 1980s, the then run-down harbour area was due for demolition. However, it has since been fully restored and is now the most lively part of the city. As night falls, these romantic lanes and public houses are crowded and musicians and artists add to the exciting atmosphere. Dublin is now a dynamic metropolis full of unique Irish charm. 
bursting with pubs and music, this most hospitable city is a wonderful combination of lively city life and infectious Irish blarney. <laughs> 